Dear participants, dear distinguished speakers, it is with, with great pleasure and honor that I welcome you all to this African Greens Federation session. Uh, Greens for struggle for democracy in Africa, which is one of the sessions during our great Global Greens virtual conference, Connecting for Green Action. I am happy to be the facilitator today and especially honored to host four honorable great leaders of the African Greens Federation, namely Honorable Dr. Frank Habineza, Member of Parliament and Founding President, Democratic Green Party of Rwanda, Honorable Professor Robin Akena Nyonja, First Vice President, African Greens Federation, Honorable Dr. Mohammed Awad, President, Egyptian Green Party, and Second Vice President, African Greens Federation, and Honorable Jean-Claude Ntezmana, Member of Parliament, Rwanda, and Secretary, uh, Secretary General, Democratic Green Party of Rwanda. To give you a brief background of our session today, Green Struggle for Democracy in Africa. Uh, green parties across Africa have found it difficult to register and fully function as political parties due to stringent and democratic laws and dictatorial and autocratic regimes in different African countries. Civil laws have been put in place that curtail freedom of speech, freedom of political assembly, and freedom of expression. Being an opposition party in some countries, it is considered as an enemy of the country. Many party members from the opposition find it hard to find jobs, both in government and in private sector. Some governments compete with green parties in order to show that they are greener themselves and that green parties are not needed. This session will therefore explore all those challenges and our panelists here will propose some solutions. And without wasting more time, I would like to call our first speaker Honorable Dr. Frank Habineza to the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, our moderator, Madam Dorothy. Yeah. And uh, one greeting to you all, uh, our fellow panelists, and uh, uh, all the participants. Uh, oh. Special greetings to you. Do you hear me? No, well, Dr. Frank, I was still speaking because I have to introduce you. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Honorable Dr. Frank Abineza is the founding president, Democratic Green Part of Rwanda. He's a member of parliament since 2018 and will go up to 2023. He's the special advisor, African Greens Federation. He's a member, Global Greens Coordination, Dr. Frank is an environmentalist, human rights, democracy, and defense uh, stroke security expert. He graduated from the National University of Rwanda in 2005 with a Bachelor of Arts in Public Administration. He got his Master of Science degree at the Swedish Defense University in 2017 in politics and war studies specializing in war studies. He got an honorary doctorate of humanities due to his work in democracy and human rights from Bethel College, Indiana, USA. He's a member of parliament since September, 2018 and vice president of the Social Affairs Committee in Rwanda. He has been a presidential candidate in the 2017 Rwanda elections representing the Democratic Green Party of Rwanda. He, also, he has also been 
chairing a coalition of political parties from different 30 countries for the last eight years since 2010 to 2018 under the umbrella organization, African Greens Federation, which is based in Burkina Faso. And now he's an executive advisor of the African Greens Federation. So welcome to the platform, Dr. Frank Abineza. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Dorothy, Madam Madaleta, uh, for that wonderful introduction. And warm greetings to all our panelists and uh, uh, the dear participants. A special wishes to Senator Janet in Australia, Madam Evelyn Sweden, and all of you uh, all. Yes, um, uh, it's really a great pleasure to share uh, with you uh, about the Green Struggle, uh, about the Green Struggle for Democracy in Africa, um, with uh, a small example from Rwanda, but also try to borrow other examples in other countries. Um, uh, so uh, I will start with uh, uh, Rwanda. I think some of you are familiar with uh, how we struggled uh, uh, for four years uh, just to have our party registered. Uh, because uh, uh, when, when we, we declared that we are uh, breaking away from the ruling party and starting an opposition party, it was really very, very difficult for us because we faced a lot of resistance, a lot of harassment, uh, we were beaten physically, uh, our meetings were disrupted violently, and uh, we denied permission to meet uh, for over seven, ten times, eight times when we were demanding for permission. The police uh, made it so difficult for us. And um, the worst was when my deputy uh, uh, vice president, my deputy uh, my, uh, vice president was uh, uh, assassinated in 2010 uh, when he got his head uh, almost cut off here. Yeah. So that was a very shocking to all of us. And some of you are aware of that. And um, this, of course, uh, uh, was a culmination into uh, several threats that we had. We had a lot of death threats, including myself, and received a lot of death threats and uh, uh, even physical attacks. And uh, um, uh, some of our members actually had even left, had gone to exile, uh, and uh, as a structure up to now in exile. And uh, uh, myself, I had to leave uh, in August 2010 before the presidential elections. Uh, where I, I ended up in Sweden, uh, where I got a political asylum and uh, continued the struggle from there with support from the Greens all over the world, from Sweden and uh, from Greens in Australia, especially thanks to Senator Bob Brown and all Australian Greens who stood with us and uh, also gave us an opportunity to, uh, to attend the Republican Australian government, the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in 2001, which was in Perth, uh, which was a, a very big uh, opener for us to continue our struggle because the Commonwealth really had got involved from that time into our struggle up to now, and they uh, did campaign for us uh, and gave us opportunities uh, whereby I was able uh, to come back in 2012 after two years in exile, and uh, then we finally got our party registered in 2013. So it took us four years. It's not uh, easy. I mean, other countries, you just, uh, um, we just uh, ask for a party to be registered and it gets registered. But uh, it's not easy uh, when you have to wait for one year, uh, two years, three years. Uh, it was so difficult. But the Greens in Sweden stood with us, especially Mama Eva, and uh, others stood with us in Sweden. And uh, we kept the struggle and uh, were able to survive uh, despite those challenges. And uh, when I came back, we were able to, um, to get registered here. So uh, that was a, 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 one big challenge, getting registered. But another, another big challenge was after we got registered, how do we function as a party? When you have all these laws in place that make it so difficult to function as a party, the party is not allowed to get financing from NGOs, even local NGOs cannot support you, uh, companies cannot support you. So basically, the government makes it so difficult uh, for a party to function. So they say that it should be only supported by members but I make sure that the members you have all, all, uh, the, all the rich people, they cannot join the party because they have threats that if they support you, they will have uh, problems with taxation, maybe the businessmen will get their uh, tax bills higher, or maybe they will uh, get some threats and so on. So you find that uh, you have a party which has no money. And that's uh, the worst thing that you have. So like you've spent all the four years, some people have died for that, but now you have the party and you have nothing to do with it. So that's a part of the struggle. And this one, I share it with other parties in Africa, yeah. So 
Then uh, after that, we of course really kept on the spirit and went into the presidential elections. And uh, it was difficult, the presidential elections. We had to go into the whole country, look for money for the campaign. And uh, then we got bad results at the end of it, which was very demoralizing. Um, but we continued the struggle for democracy because the most important thing that we're able to have the green agenda uh, in the country, people were able to, hire, to hear about our manifesto and they were able to uh, traverse the whole country, uh, to get the support from the youth, from the women, and even the intellectuals. So finally, people started to understand us because before they thought we are rebels, we are enemies of the country, and the others thought that we are unrealistic, that we have ideas which are unrealistic, that we should be in Europe, that things are already important in Europe, but not in Africa. So they would, we said, no, but uh, the green ideology is universal. It's not only good for Europe, but it's also good for all of us. So, but we kept on uh, emphasizing. Then 2018, we went into the parliamentary elections, and finally we were able to get 5% uh, of the national vote, and we got two MPs. And a year later, we campaigned for Senate, and then we got one senator, Senator Alex Mugisha, who is on this call. Uh, so basically, that has been a great achievement, despite all the challenges. But of course, the struggle continues. We do have uh, um, upcoming elections next year for parliament. So we hope that maybe we'll do more and get more votes and more seats in parliament. So saying that, uh, we've seen our Greens struggle also in Uganda. I think uh, I'm not share more about that, but it's not uh, been easy. Also, our friends in Kenya, uh, they are struggling. Uh, of the party leader has been a, a former member of parliament, has been in parliament, uh, but uh, after he started the party, they've tried uh, several times to uh, go into elections, but getting the seat, it's quite difficult, especially uh, whereby the electoral system uh, is so difficult that uh, it's a first, is it first past the, uh, the post, uh, winner takes it all. So it's so difficult to win when you are competing with all these big parties and big powers. Uh, so the call from Kenya is to have a, a, a proportional representation, like what we have here in Rwanda or what they have in Sweden. So at least with that proportional representation, people, uh, parties uh, have a chance. So I would say that uh, our Greens in Mali, they are struggling, with, especially now with the military coup d'etats that are taking place all the time. It's so difficult for them to function in such an environment, uh, but they do have at least a mayor and some local councillors. I uh, hope they will continue struggling. In Burkina Faso, we have had there's a recent coup d'etat there. Uh, they have been trying be their best, yeah, but has been in existence for some time. They had some successes when they were in parliament, but now they lost it. And now it's so difficult even to enter into local council but especially with these uh, always military uh, disruptions and so on. So they are pushing on. In Senegal, you know, our Greens there, they have been pushing, they had a chance to enter into government, and, uh, but then the party uh, got disagreements, and then uh, after the disagreements, then they got to, uh, into different factions, and now I think they are struggling more now to build their party. Yeah. So I would say a lot of more, uh, of course now, uh, maybe I'll go to Mauritius, we are our friends in Mauritius. Uh, they have been struggling to be recognized uh, as the black people there. Uh, they, they are not recognized properly because they are descendants of the slaves and they have been calling for reparations of the slaves. And uh, because the biggest community is the Indian community in Mauritius. So they, are, they have been uh, uh, having a lot of hunger strikes and sometimes they have been arrested. You know, our friend Silvio uh, Michel there. And, uh, up now, they still have the struggle because they have asked for uh, the Green Reparation Fund uh, from the UK, which they have not got yet. And now they have also asked for, called for the Americans to quit the, uh, the biggest archipelago uh, called Archipelago. Uh, it's a, a big part in, uh, uh, in the Indian Ocean, which is uh, now an American base. I think even the French have a base there. So it's a part of the country which has been taken over by America. So the Greens are part of the movement that are calling for uh, for the evacuation of the American troops from there. So they are part of the bigger uh, group. Uh, and uh, we see in Madagascar, they have also the struggle continues, but they are now in government. Uh, and uh, they, they will hope that they will continue to be, uh, of course, they're also in parliament, we continue, they continue to have success there. So I will leave another space for our fellow uh, participants to highlight uh, other struggles for democracy in Africa. Thank you, Madam Moderator. We are not hearing you, Madam Moderator, you are on mute. You are on mute. Thank you, 
Thank you so much, Dr. Franca. Thank you for sharing with us your, um, your story. It is a success story, and I'm so proud of Democratic Green Party of Rwanda. Our next speaker today is uh, Honorable Professor Robin Akena Nyonja. Uh, Dr. Honorable Professor Robin Akena Nyonja is an international development expert. She's an environmentalist and was awarded an honorary professor by the Academic Union of the University of Oxford in business and management. She brings on board rich experience in environmentalism, entrepreneurship, international development, business, and political leadership, as well as corporate governance. She's the founder and chair of Pilot International, a social enterprise registered in Uganda with networks and partnership promoting sustainable development in over 100 countries globally. Through Pilot International, she has contributed uh, to institutional capacity development of various businesses, private sector, NGOs, and facilitated investment within Africa and globally, as well as designing and implementing multinational development, renewable energy, climate change, and innovative project. She's the first vice president of the African Greens Federation, a political federation based in Burkina Faso. And in this capacity, she has provided services for democracy, advocacy, development, and digital finance. She's the president of the Women Economic Forum in Uganda, and she's the GI 100 Security and Defense Ugandan Country Chair for Mission Million, and a former parliamentary candidate of Kawempe North in the last Ugandan elections, which were held in January 2021. Uh, so she will be really talking about what she has experienced and how difficult it was. Honorable Professor Robin Aken Nanyonja is a public speaker who has chaired and spoken at different conferences for over a decade. I therefore invite you, Honorable Professor Robin Aken Nanyonja, to speak to us. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Dorothy, our facilitator. Thank you for all the panelists. Um, yes, I'm going to be actually speaking uh, as a former, as a former uh, Green Parliamentary candidate in Uganda, because I have a lot of interesting uh, lessons to share and uh, to learn also from others. Uh, Yes, uh, as uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Frank Habineza has stated, uh, given an overview in Africa, it's actually a very, very challenging uh, moment for us, the Greens in, in Africa, uh, because first of all, uh, the political competition is not fully leveled for all political parties, uh, given that uh, the Green parties in Africa are still really small parties with uh, a fewer membership, and uh, you know struggles like uh, uh, financial support and you know um, and uh, also uh, mobilization and promotion to the communities within Africa. We are really just venturing and uh, gaining entry, which is not easy. Uh, for example, during the lockdowns uh, in Uganda, that's when our campaigns uh, took place. It was really difficult to go out there, even to have a, a small rally or whatever. But when it came to the ruling government, they would hold rallies, and then uh, you know uh, the MPs of the ruling government, the presidential candidates. It was like business as usual. So as uh, parties that are really squashed, uh, we find it really difficult to make a, a breakthrough into the government because of the unleveled uh, level of competition. Uh, more to that, opposition parties don't have a financial share from the government. Officially, previously, 
political parties would be um, would have a, a, a financial package uh, from the or from the government. They were authorized to that, you know. But all that now in Uganda, it was uh, scraped off by the by the ruling government uh, to further, of course, squash. If someone or if a party does not have money, it's really very very difficult to to get a political win. Uh huh. Besides that, our parties, uh, they are still regarded as environmental parties. So more or less like if we, we are environmental parties, uh, the governments in Africa, they have uh, ministries of environment. So uh, these uh, citizens tend to think, oh, after all, you are an environmental party, environment is already taken care of, you know, and that kind of thing. And some also refer to us as corporate parties because you know these are parties promoted by highly educated people, maybe who have gone a lot, done a lot of travels, exposure here and there, and the public there say, mm -hmm, corporate parties. Will you manage uh, the data politics in Africa, or you are just uh, corporate parties talking and and maybe that's it. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, besides all that, of course, you know very well that uh, politics is, is very expensive, uh, not only in Africa, but elsewhere. I think even elsewhere, uh, they spend lots of money compared uh, uh, in Africa. So given that uh, the Green parties, they are still small parties, they are not financed, uh, they don't have a financial share from the government, and uh, even support outside is uh, still limited. Uh, it is a very, very, very big hindrance, really, for us to 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 have a, a breakthrough. But also, there are green parties in Africa. There is this radicalism versus peaceful coexistence, which personally I actually witnessed. You know, with the green parties, peaceful coexistence, come grassroots to democracy, and whatever. But I noticed that a radical party, uh, we have people power in Uganda, a radical party with no ideology, with no proper plan to even support those voters or anything, uh, it uh, gained a lot of attention from, from the people, even from the village, the village, the, the, the very, very grassroots people there. It gained a lot of attention. So to me, yes, uh, we are into peaceful coexistence because uh, the population is still say that in order to take over power, you must show power, you know? And to them, power is like engage in massive protests, be arrested by the police. Uh, with, with that, you attract a lot of attention from the media or so and so has given bail. Uh, now this one has been arrested. So somehow all that, they stay. Uh, all that is captivated into the minds of the voters until the election day. That is what they have in mind. So and so was arrested. It is a struggle to take over government. You don't just uh, coexist peacefully with the government. You just have to take over power. So, and they gained a lot of uh, a lot of support. Uh, they got a lot of. It was actually landslide. So for us, the Greens who had even projects in the communities, uh, who have a very clear, really manifesto to uplift them from the poverty, from the challenges they are going through. At the last minute, all that goes away because uh, they have one thing uh, in mind. They must remove the government. To remove the government, you don't coexist. Projects will come later, but for them in their mind, you want a party that shows power to, of, to, to remove, to, you know, to, to remove the government from power. So as Greens, I think we have to really to do, to do more, maybe programs or advocacy or activism, you know, to gain uh, visibility, more vis to overpower these existing uh, 
opposition parties that yes, we are also there. We are green, but we are political parties and we have capacity to take over government and lift our communities. Um, so I think basically I would end there and also let my colleagues continue from there. Uh, if you have any questions, I think the time for that is allocated and I'll keep in here up to the end. Thank you very much all for your attention and thank you for your contributions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Honorable Professor Robina Kenanyunja. Thank you for giving us the picture of what really happened because we are hearing it from the horse's mouth. Um, thank you, Doc. Uh, I can see some questions popping up, but like uh, uh, Honorable Robina said, we'll have a session for that after our, our last speaker. So please prepare your questions and we will have them. And uh, the, our next speaker now is uh, Dr. Muhammad Awad. Dr. Muhammad Awad is the president, Green Party of Egypt, and he's the second vice president of the African Greens Federation. Dr. Muhammad, has been a member of the Egyptian Green Party since its inception in 1990, and he is currently serving as the party president. Dr. Awad is the second vice president of the African Greens Federation. Between 2012 and 2013, he served as the member of the Egyptian parliament, leading international affairs and the National Security Committee. Dr. Awad studied a Bachelor of Sciences in Chemical Engineering at Cairo University and has experience in environmental engineering and the O&G industry, construction, engineering, management, and proposals manager. Additionally, Dr. Awad obtained his BA of Law from Cairo University and his Master's of Law from the Institute de Trois de Affaires International, IDAI. His experience in the field of law saw him become a founder and partner of GAD and Fair Group Law Firm. Dr. Award specializes in commercial, arbitration, and industrial projects agreements. We are happy and we are eager to hear from you, Dr. Mohamed Awad. Please take the floor. Thank you too much, my dear friend, uh, Madam Dorsey. And uh, at the beginning, I have to tell everyone good morning or good evening. It depends on the timing in your country. Uh, and I have to uh, introduce my deep thanks to the Global Green and the organizer for this Congress. Actually, it, it seems so exciting uh, Congress uh, within a very difficult time for the humanity. Uh, the title of our session is talking about the green struggle for, democra for democracy in Africa. Well, so exciting title. Taking into consideration that uh, Greens in Africa, they are still in the early emerging phases. Uh, while from the other side, all of us know very well that Africa has many challenges regarding the democracy. At the beginning, excuse me, I'm going to say some short phrases with some figures. Africa has experienced 201 military cops since 1966 till now. 100 military cops have been experienced over 10 
years from 66 to 77. 1999, African Union declared they will not recognize changes in ruling power at any, at any African countries unless it have been run in accordance with democratic procedures and full transparency. Egyptian military cup in 2013, the first since the declaration of the African Union. Total African population around 360 million capita. 55% of the total African population are living blue poverty level. More than six African countries have experienced civil wars. As a result of the civil wars, it's ended with 13 million murders and 33 million homeless. I let this president figures aside and asking some small questions to myself. 12 years, a period of hope. Why? By the end of the Cold War, a wave began to end autocracy in Africa. This was because Bush administration exerting pressure on the dictatorship by linking financial aid in Africa to good governance. This approach led to the democratic transformation in some African countries such as Ghana, Senegal, which have not experienced military cuts. Similarly, there were countries that experienced democratic practice, but which soon faced setback as a result of military cuts d'etat, such as Kenya, Again, the same questions. 12 years of peace, 12 years, a period of hope. Why? The African Union has played an influential role in transformation toward good governance in many African countries by suspending relations with, dictat with, dict with the dictatorial governance. Peaceful handling of power in some African countries has encouraged neighboring countries to do the same in their countries, especially under similar circumstances. Apostasy from democracy. Why? Military cuts detail starting in 2013 was one of the reasons. Very honest, I'm saying that. The rigid elections is prevailed in Africa. Manipulation of constitutions through fictitious referendums everywhere in Africa. Corruption, money smuggling, where people fail to follow. Declination of the African Union, declination of African Union rule due to compliances with international pressures. Sudan, Burkina Faso, last three, four weeks, a case. Terrorism. Is it president to the dictatorship or successor to it and its followers? Young people have lost hope of change. All of what I'm saying is the reasons 
is trial to answer apostasy from democracy. Why? The African Union and ECOWAS failed to handle the challenges of misconduct and comprehensive governance. Chad, Mali, Kenya, Sudan, Tunisia, and Burkina Faso. Okay, because we are saying green struggle for democracy, for democracy in Africa. We state a lot of reasons for lack of democracy in our countries. But agreeing, do we have a real solution, resolution for the current situation in Africa? Many analysis has po have pointed out that a real challenge to good governance and enabling Africa to catch up with emerging countries of the world is to give a new generation of educated young people the opportunity to take a chance instead of corrupt ruling elites. In my vision, if these solutions seems not sufficient, given that these young people also grow up in these corrupt circumstances. How can he, how can he be at a good educational level under a bad governance? However, there is the resolutions, the proposed one may be optimal, provided that in a rapid dynamic and rapid change, this is the only guarantee of rising public awareness of the requirements of a state administration with a minimum of mistakes due to lack of experience. What is expected from Green? In one word, political qualification for us. Continue to fight corruption. Proceed for general public elections. Opening, opening channels with African organ, official organizations such as African Union. That's the end. Thank you. Floor is you, Darcy, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Ward. Thank you for sharing with us the history and the numbers. It was really good. And now uh, we need to go to our Honorable Ntezma Najan Claude, who is a member of parliament of the public uh, and, and member of the public accounts committee in Rwanda. He's the member of the committee in charge of assessment of the Chamber of Deputies activities and deputies conduct, discipline and immunity in Rwanda. Honorable Jean-Claude Ntezmana is the Secretary General of the Democratic Green Party of Rwanda and um, a member of parliament He's the member of the Public Accounts Committee and member of the Committee in Charge of Discipline and Ethics of MPs. He holds a master's degree in international relations and democracy and a bachelor's degree in public administration. He's from the Democratic Green Party of Rwanda. Honorable Jean-Claude Ntezmana, I hereby welcome you to the floor. Thank you so much, Madam Dorothy. Are you hearing me? Yes, very well. Okay. Can I continue? Please continue. Yeah. 
Uh, I also thank my previous uh, presentation from my Honorable Dr. Frank Avineza, but uh, I didn't hear, I didn't follow his presentation just because of the network of my computer. So I don't know what uh, he talked about. I'm just going to uh, share uh, what I think uh, and what I know about uh, green struggle, green struggle for democracy in Africa. Uh, it is really uh, a big uh, challenge having uh, a political party in Africa, especially an opposition political party, because uh, there, are, there are main two main challenges. The first one is the process of registering a political party here in Africa. I'm going to share uh, the experience of, of my political party, Democratic Green Party of Rwanda. For example, we have started uh, uh, a political party here in Rwanda in 2009. It took us four years in order to register our political party. Uh, it, it was really a journey which is uh, similar like uh, what Jesus, Jesus passed through when he came in, here in the earth because some of uh, our members left the country and went the country and went in ex in, a, in exile uh, others uh, left the, the party firstly not because they wanted others uh, went missing uh, and uh, not willingly but uh, it, 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 through the just uh, the, the this issue of starting a political party uh, we were not informed before when we started we, we thought uh, it is easy but uh, after entering this process it was really very difficult and according to the laws it was also a, a challenge because the law said that time, even now I think it is still the same, you are not allowed to, to meet when you are almost 10 people. You have to write a letter asking a permission when you are about to talk about politics. Whether in the bar, in the hotel, at home, it is not allowed. So launching the political party it was a big challenge as a Democratic Green Party members. Even mobilizing people, meeting them, it was also a big challenge. After that, having a permission to hold a national congress where we, we, we wanted to register a political party official before the public notary, it was also a big challenge because we wrote almost 12 letters asking the permission and uh, three of them were accepted. But uh, the last one, the, the two, the previous two, we were beaten in the conference hall and the conference meeting was canceled some of our, our people were, were injured and went in the hospital. It, it was a, a terrifying situation. And this passed through all media, national media and uh, external media like BBC and VOA. Uh, some of uh, those people who came and beat us were taken to prison. When, when we followed them, asking the national police about them, they said they were released, which means 
uh, uh, it was uh, very scary to our people. Some of them decided to leave the, the political party. And uh, fortunately, uh, after two years, when uh, our president went in exile, he came back and we, we started again to continue uh, this process of registering the political party. Uh, uh, in 2000, he came back in 2012. In 2013, we got registered. We got the permission to function legally here in, in Rwanda. We immediately started the process of participating in all, all elections that happened. Uh, in 2017, it, uh, he, he stood up as a presidential candidate. Uh, we had a rally all over the, in, the, in all districts of the country. It, it, it went well, but uh, surprisingly, we failed in a manner we, we, we didn't know how to, it went uh, because we, we got really uh, a bad votes when we, we expected at least to have uh, some good results. And we, we, we did not give up. In 2018, we, we stand as uh, members of the Democratic Green Party in the parliamentary elections. And uh, we passed, we, we have now two seats in the parliament and one seat in the Senate. We, we are now struggling of uh, advocating our policies. And uh, what I did not mention, in order to, to register our political party as an experience, we, pet we petitioned the government to different policies, rules, and regulations. Some of, some of them were rejected, others were accepted. Uh, one of them that helped a uh, political party to, to, to get a session is we wanted the government to allow the political parties that, are, that want to be registered to to, to not go to the Ministry of Government to have an independent organ. And this was accepted. We have now, we had that time and still till now the Rwanda Governance Board where our political party was registered. And uh, we are still even now asking the government to allow the members of uh, different political parties to have members uh, uh, in, the, in the national executive, in the national electoral commission, where we can at least follow all the votes of different political parties, including ours. We, we are still asking, petitioning so many petitions to the government, and we, we, we think and we hope that uh, one day we will be heard and these petitions will be helpful to different political parties, especially our political party. And uh, we also uh, uh, give, uh, do our role in the mem member in the, in the parliament where we, we give some bills of asking the government to, to to allow some laws that can help uh, the, our citizens and uh, to have more profits, to have more advantage, freedom of speech, having a say and stay safe because sometimes people are still fearing, having fear, scaring that if they mention something that is not uh, friendly to the government, maybe you can be jailed and uh, our political party was really uh, a pioneer among others to stand and 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 speak freely without fear and 
so many uh, now can stand and think that uh, it is possible for, for an opposition political party to express without fear, to do politics without fear, to reach our members from Kigali, from the capital city to the village without fear and to achieve all the program or political program we have. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Honorable Jean-Claude Ntezmana. Thank you for sharing um, what you experienced during the elections in Rwanda. We were really following and we saw how the Democratic Green part of Rwanda had successful rallies, and we were all hopeful. But because of the corruption, because of the uh, undemocratic situations, things changed at the last moment and we were so scared and we thought they would never get anything out of it. But luckily enough, in 2018, we were really, really happy to see that we got you as a, a member of parliament and Dr. Frank Abineza. And uh, also recently, uh, like last year, we got the senator. Uh, so it was really, really uh, good news to hear that we got uh, Honorable Alexis as a senator. So uh, Democratic Green part of Rwanda became like our hope. <laughs> it is our hope and uh, we are here and very, very, uh, eager to learn more on how you people succeeded. Yet, when I look at the three countries in East Africa, you were the people who were really treated so badly. But you went on. You went on and actually succeeded. So I think we are encouraged that even us, with our bad system, maybe one day, one time, we shall be able to get uh, a member of parliament. Uh, to go to our next program, we shall have our question and answer session now. And then later, after um, the 20 minutes uh, of, of this session, we shall have our speakers back to tell us the solutions of or way forward on what we should do as greens in Africa, as greens globally, how, what, what should we do to gain what we are struggling for? For example, Dr. Frank Abineza talked about the, the system we have, especially in Uganda and Kenya, which cannot allow us to get MPs, the system of the winner takes it all. Um, doc, uh, again, Dr. Frank and uh, Bineza and Honorable Ananyunja Robina talked about how our green political parties are perceived in Africa. They are perceived as, um, as intellectual ones. People think we are so intellectual for Africa. We are only fit for Europe. Those are some of the solutions we want to hear in the last part of our, of our sessions. How, how can we let people know that we are like other political parties and actually what we are doing will be uh, great to take our countries forward and to bring democracy and social justice in our countries. So without wasting any more of our time, I would like us to continue to receive questions from our audiences. There is one that came up before. Um, it was uh, from Mr. David and it said, Yeah, I would like to read for you the question from the audience. I, I think maybe we can start with that. 
before we go to any other to any other question but still if someone is really ready they can go on but the question was from mr david newman and it was uh he would be interested to hear how you campaign in each country is it did you use leaflets was it conversing was it village meetings was it walking around your your your, your village with party symbol on your heads or psycho posters so that question was directed to all of you since he asked uh in each of your campaigns so any of our speakers can answer that question thank you so much thank you may i start yes please <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much uh, uh mr newman um indeed we the campaigns in africa are much more different uh, from the campaigns in europe uh, we use uh, a lot of things first of all the um, kind of uh, big rallies uh, we we do have to go into a village you get like a football ground uh, you have to have mobilized people to come there and then you have to have done prepared uh, work before so you have a party agents who are going to talk to people and then must have music. Uh, then you have to have also uh, party colors. You have to have t-shirts with uh, party logos and so on, and then leaflets. And as you have seen, our secretary general has a, 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 a party shirt, which has a party uh, symbols. So all those things, we have to do them. Uh, the, now the, the most difficult thing is this, is that uh, for the government party, they force people to come. So they close down all the shops, uh, they uh, bring all the buses, put them in, and then at midnight and by the morning, the stadium is full. So, uh, and then by the time the media comes, they find the whole uh, football ground is full, the stadium is full, and the people have all been given shirts and reflets and they're all flagging. Inside the heart, they are not happy. But they're all laughing and very happy. And now the media shows how the president has a big support. And then for us who don't have that capacity, we cannot close shops, we cannot uh, stop in a business. Uh, they now compare us that we have very few people on the other side. Uh, so uh, then they say, who are you? You see the president has a big support and you have no support. So it, that's the biggest challenge. But what we do, we do our best. Uh, we, we, we convince people to come. Uh, we also try to put it in, uh, in radio, local radio stations that we shall have a campaign trail there. And then, luckily enough, we had uh, uh, one of our campaign rallies where we had about 200,000 people where they came. It was marvelous. Another one, we had like 50,000 people, and people were even going to the trees on the branches of the trees. And when the government sees this, because they have not used the same efforts they have done, they get so annoyed. If you get 5,000 people, just people coming to hear your voice, your, your message, and you, you and they try to stop them. Actually, we had this issue of whereby they mobilized the police to stop people from coming. And they put them in the smaller roads, the smaller paths everywhere. People are stopped from coming to your campaign rallies. And people have to force themselves to come, and they, sometimes they are beaten, and uh, they are threatened also. And in other cases, uh, we went in one uh, place to campaign in the southern province where they closed people in their houses. They told them no one shall come out of the house. <laughs> so then we came there and we don't see anybody. And in another place, they took people, they came and took them away to another place where they had to do a campaign rally. And normally, they will have a program that where the day we are going to campaign, it's only one party to campaign from there. But sometimes they try to do the same to make sure that we fail. And then they show the media that we have no support. So we did quite a great work. And one time we were going to a stadium and they took people away and went to the stadium and we had about 50 people. It was really a big disaster. In another press, we went to do a campaign rally and we were supposed to do it in the stadium, uh, not the football ground. And then they, they said, no, 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 you cannot do from here. It's not safe for you. We have a good place for you. So we followed them, they took us to a cemetery, a graveyard. 
And uh, our secretary general was a company manager. He said, well, now this is completely impossible. He said, well, we, we're not going to campaign to the dead people. We want right people to talk to, not dead people. And uh, then the deputy chairperson of the National Trade Commission was with us. Can you imagine? So they all came to witness how our failure. We said we cannot campaign from there. And then uh, that was the same province. So when we left that press without doing anything, but the media was following, we went in the town and then they brought motorbikes. People having uh, branches of trees, branches of bananas, like a warfare going inside our cars like this, like this. You know, I don't know if you know motorbikes. They, they are confusing everything. And uh, like he, he assaulting us, uh, uh, we said well, this was completely impossible. So we still had to, to not do anything that town. And another place we went, then they had uh, mobilized children. They came, the children listened to us. And when the presidential candidate stood up to speak, uh, when I, I could say, uh, we say, hey, Rwanda, or Republic of Rwanda, I said, no. I say, hey, the, this village, I said, no. And then they, all of a sudden, the kids had uh, leaflets from the ruling party. They started waving the party flag, the ruling party flag. And we're just school children. And then all of a sudden, they started getting stones and sand and throwing that to us. So basically, and when you talk, they come and say, no, these are just children. No one sent them. Who brought these children? You know, as if the children brought themselves there. So this is the real campaign in Africa. And uh, this, they like this confrontation because they don't want people to hear your message because they know you have a good message. And uh, if people hear your message, people will be convinced. So they try everything possible so that people don't hear your message, don't get your reference. If you have the posters, they try to put them down. Your posters, you put them on the, some places where they, they tell us to put your posters, company posters. In the morning, you don't find any poster. So they do everything possible. And then on the national television, uh, they give you like one minute uh, of your campaign. So no matter all have the same period, same, same whatever. But they give you one minute, and then they bring the photos whereby you have few people in the stadium, and the president has a big, but they say, you see, uh, this is the campaign that is going on. So I tell you that it was uh, really very chaotic. And this, I'm saying, is the same in Uganda. They're, they're doing the same thing. The government party does the same thing that like the government party in Rwanda does. And uh, if you don't have money, it's becoming very difficult because you must have money because the government party sometimes gives incentives. They call them like bribes. They give people salt, they give them soap, they give them even sugar and what. And they do it in the, in the middle of the night because the official is not allowed. So, so they tell them that you vote for us, we are going to give you sugar that we have given you and shall be giving you. The other person, MP, candidate is poor, has nothing. And our people, because of poverty, sometimes they believe that they take the soap and sugar and they suffer for the next five years. Because they, after they vote, no one comes back. They just disappear, those people have been elected here. And people always fall into that trap. So it's a continuous struggle, continuous process. Maybe I will stop there and the other colleagues will share more. Thank you. Thank you so, so, so much, Dr. Frank Abineza. It is so interesting to hear that because we've seen it. And uh, this gives me uh, <laughs> a reminder of what really happened. And uh, Dr. Frank Abineza, it's okay to talk for, for even what happens in Uganda. For example, he was in Uganda uh, for a long time and he knows exactly what happens. So when he talks, what happens in Rwanda is what happens in Uganda. He's very sure of what he's talking about. Secondly, now, yeah, I can see uh, people raising their hands, but I would like to give a chance to Dr. Muhammad Awad. Why? Because uh, Dr. Frank Abineza, what he has said is uh, um, maybe East African. Can we hear from Dr. Awad what happens in North Africa, in Egypt, to see whether it's different from what happens in East Africa? Thank you so much, Dr. Muhammad Awadi. Thank you so much, uh, my friend Darcy. Well, actually, uh, first of all, I agree with all what has been said by uh, our uh, colleague, Dr. Abiniza. It's already, we already, all of us exercise such things in our countries. But currently, that's my surprise for you, Dr. Beniza. <laughs> currently, uh, what you have said, which have been practiced by us also in Egypt, is a dream. And actually, we need to do it again. Because 
right now, we don't have an opposition. It's not allowed on the Muslim world, whether in assembly, even within a knock door, knocking door, to meet with the people in person, whether a meeting internally in our parties. And to be very honest, just I passed the uh, last five months, I, I, I was invited to an assembly done by a group of political uh, parties. And uh, I thank our God that I went safe because I was logic of what I have said, which is not allowed. Currently, we have a completely different situation. Make us wishing 2010 in Egypt to come back again. That's the reality. Oh, God. Thank you so much, Dr. Muhammad Awad. Uh, I, I'm happy that we have to hear from you because it's a real surprise, like you said. I didn't expect that there is no opposition now in Egypt. I'm so surprised and we really need to do um, uh, to do a lot, I think, for our African countries. Uh, the ne next question is to um, from Melod. I'm going to read it because it's directly to uh, Honorable Ntezimana Jean-Claude. I hope you're still on. Please come on. It is uh, yes. to Honorable Jean-Claude Ntezimana, and it says, such courage and prevalence. It is from uh, Mr. Melod, uh, it's from Melod to Chalvin, and it says to Honorable Jean-Claude Ntezimana, such courage and per perseverance. I am so impressed by your struggle and the things you are able to achieve. Um, who were the people who assaulted party members when you tried to hold your first Congress in Rwanda? Were they sent by government, members of, of opposition parties, or others? Please answer that directly. Thank you so much for the question. It's a good question. Uh, that time, uh, we had no exactly signs that can prove that uh, these people were sent by this or that, this one or that, but uh, because of our manifesto, because of our, of our project, our ambition, and uh, as I said, we were the only opposition party that uh, wanted and that was at least pushing to get registration. Uh, uh, for us, we, we used to say these people came from the ruling party. We, that's what we pronounced in the news, but uh, we had no evidence to prove because those who came and uh, switched off the rights and beat us were released when we, they were arrested by the national police. And it was uh, clearly passed in, in a different media, which means that uh, if uh, these people came from somewhere, somewhere else, they, they would be arrested and brought in the court. That's uh, what we can say. I think it's clear. Um, I want to add on something. Yes, yes, go on. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, as he said, uh, we were very sure that you were from the ruling party. And of course, the ruling party is the same as government. Uh, in Africa, it's the same. <laughs> Maybe in other countries, it's different. But in Africa, when it's the ruling party, it's the government because they control everything. So the people who came to assault us, they had guns. Pistols. We saw them, we saw pistols with our own eyes. We had diplomats. We had uh, diplomats from American embassy, from the Netherlands embassy, the Belgian embassy, and other countries. We all saw the guns. So who in the country like ours, it's not like America where people can have guns. In our country, no one is allowed to, to carry a gun. 
So no one can carry a gun if he's a member of security forces. That's one evidence. So we saw the guns with our own eyes. And then our, my guys, I call them my guys because were, we had some strong able men who were able to arrest these people, who were able to arrest them. And then when we arrested them, put them down because the police was actually outside and the police never came in. They came, those guys came in, shut the doors, switched off the lights and started getting chairs, throwing them around and approaching the podium where we were seated. So the police continued being outside watching and not entering, to, not intervening. They don't want to intervene now. This year, they're not involved in public politics. So they came, came to protect us and left us die there. And now, when we got these guys down, when we put them outside, we were able to identify them. So there were journalists who were, we had journalists who had, um, who knew these people. So we found out that some of them were members of the local defense force. Local defense force is a, a, a military organization. And others were members of the Department of Military Intelligence. Uh, those are not civilians. And others were uh, members of the internal security organization. Ah, others were ex-soldiers. So, I, when we say uh, we, that these uh, people from the real party, it was just a way of uh, trying to minimize, but it was pure that it, they were sent to do a mission. And we had information that actually they had even orders to kill. Though we are just lucky that we were not killed. Yeah. They were very threatened because why they, I need to mention this is because our Secretary General of the party at the time had been the first president of the Ring Party. So he had left the Ring Party and joined the Green Party and became the Secretary General. So the government saw this as a big threat. They said, now it's a new government in waiting. They were saying, yes, and actually we had the capacity to take over government. And uh, we had other members from ambassadors, from ministers, and also on. So they said they, the only thing they had to do was to stop us in with any ways possible. And that was one of the ways. And uh, uh, so I have no, uh, we have said this before, and even the media. So we're very sure that these had a mission, and which actually they achieved because after they, they, they did that, the police officially came and said the meeting is closed because of security reasons. <laughs> And from that time, we were never given any permission to meet again. So the mission was achieved. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've heard from Dr. Frank Abineza. We heard from uh, Honorable Intesma Najan Cloud and from Dr. Muhammad Awad. May you, we now hear from uh, uh, Honorable Professor Robin Akena Nyonja as we continue. Honorable Rabina. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Dorothy. Actually, I would like to put up my hand because I want to react to a comment, question from the chat from yes. uh, Janet, Janet Wong. Janet Wong from, uh, I think, Australia, Australian Greens. Uh, yes. About, uh, yes, about uh, what I mentioned in my presentation as uh, this perception of the people yeah. towards the Green Party, <laughs> uh, referring it as a corporate parties, diplomatic parties, uh, environmental parties. Uh, uh, people feel like uh, we are not, uh, like we are detached from them, from the reality. Uh, but in my situation, uh, my perception, I think it is due to the perceptions of these local people. Because, I mean, ideally, if you have someone with a rich CV, they are well educated, they've done a lot of work before they join the politics, it would be a credit that this person has really experience and ideas and connections really to transform the societies. But uh, the problem of, uh, of our local people, the citizens, they want you to be able really to do the, the because you are competing uh, uh, with, with actual local, I would say, with really grassroots people. Like for, for my case, I think uh, for the MOP, I was the most educated uh, person on the, uh, in that race, but also the one with a, a manifesto that would really uh, seem uh, trustable, practical to, to uplift the, the, the standards uh, of living of the people and advocacy and whatever. But still, these people want to see someone like 
Are you able to remove this garbage uh, in my society, in my village, by you, by yourself? Um, uh, during Larry's, for example, uh, my opponents would uh, cook porridge and serve. <laughs> And serve the citizens, I say myself, this is really getting complicated because uh, then you can, you have to hire these, uh, you know, maybe women from the markets to cook food, to prepare porridge, but they also want the manifesto. So uh, in my perception, since it's also happening in Australia and maybe elsewhere, I think we really have to continue with a serious advocacy and education of the masses. What really to expect from a political leader, uh, what the political leaders should uh, deliver on. Because even this porridge or removing garbage from other communities by yourself, it is done by these uh, you know, competitors locally only during the campaign period only during the campaign period, and then the, the people vote, and then these people are never seen to really uh, bring anything substantial, be it in the parliament, be it in the communities. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Robina Nanyonja. Um, uh, uh, some people have been raising their hands for a long time. For example, Mr. Moses Gichuho, could you please uh, uh, ask your question? Mr. Moses Gichuho, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, yes, I am. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Secretary General and honorable members, uh, green greetings. Uh, my name is Moses Gichuho. I am the national youth leader of United Green Movement. Um, in Kenya. Let me start by asking, uh, putting across a line that the future of Africa is the young people. I go further and say that the future of African democracy is the young people. The vice president said it very well when he said that we are still as greens in Africa, we are still in our early stages. And, and what we need in my thought is the warmth of each other. Because if you appear to be a lone ranger, it becomes easy to be, to be targeted by these mainstream parties. And I think that is important. My question then to the leadership, based that the biggest potential of Africa is we the young people. And I speak like this because I am a national youth leader. I, I know I've reached out to Mr. President uh, during COVID time and he had promised me after COVID time, we will get some time. But my question is, what are some of the plans that we have to get more young people? Because it is appointed for every generation to have its time in leadership and then to exit the stage. And my question is, I sit here as a green from Africa, a young leader. I'm asking myself, have we put or are we putting plans in place to ensure that there is perpetuity um, uh, of the next generation. Uh, and, and this is important because, for example, here in Kenya, I, I led a, a youthful march of more than 200 young people where I petitioned parliament to provide a, a stipend of 200 US dollars for every unemployed graduate. Because one of the problems and what I was trying, we were trying to highlight is the mismanagement and uh, the corruption that is in the government. And, and one of the things about the importance of, again, the young people, the leadership mentoring we the young people, and we participating meaningfully, is that the, 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 the party then has a future. So here's my question. My concern is the future is sustainability. Today, even we, the Green Party, we are anchored on sustainability. What are the plans towards ensuring that there is perpetuity, mentoring the young people, bringing us together so we can learn from each other? Over to you. Thank you very much. And I look forward to engaging with young people and the Green Forum. Asante sana, Madam Dorothy. Uh, Asante sana, Moses. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, I think Dr. Frank is raising his hand. Dr. Muhammad Awad is raising his hand. Uh, maybe because we already have Global Young Greens and we are really, really, really so proud of the youth 
in our uh, global grains. Uh, <laughs> so, but what should I do? I should give the chance first to Dr. Frank Abineza, since he's on the global greens and he was one of the young greens. So maybe he can be able to answer you that question. And also I would give a chance to Dr. Muhammad Awad because he's, a, um, he's also a senior member. He will be able to answer you, then you maybe will be satisfied and, and you'll have hope. Dr. Mm -hmm. Frank. Th thank you very much, uh, Madam Dorothy, and uh, thank you so much, to Moses. Uh, first of all, I apologize for not having uh, get got back to you. Uh, please, I tried to look for the messages and I lost them. Please do write to me again. I will be very glad uh, uh, to talk more and to see how we can actually collaborate more uh, with your party. Uh, we did discuss it a bit in the East African Business Federation, so we would be glad here to extend more. Uh, deliver a message to the president that I, I can send another message, a new message on official email, then we will we'll renew the, uh, the talks and perhaps we can uh, discuss more. So back to your question, <clears throat> uh, how to engage young people, uh, we have two ways. We have both on national party, but also we do have on the continental and the global level. So maybe uh, I will start with uh, the continental uh, then global, and then I'll end with the national. Uh, so we have had efforts, and actually how I got uh, uh, involved uh, globally is well through the Young Greens. I think Dorothy, uh, you know, of course you know Tom, Thomas Achaita, so it's from Uganda. So we uh, had the first Global Young Greens Congress in Kenya. This was in 2007. Eight, eight. 2008, thank you. So, and that was at the same time when we had the World Social Forum, which was also in Nairobi. So, um, having been uh, in environmental movement at the time, and I had expressed in, uh, willingness to start a Green Party in 2003, so I had started the process. So, people knew that I had, there was a party uh, in formation in process in Rwanda. So, I was invited to went to Professor Angari Mathai's office, and then we got involved into uh, uh, this Young Greens, organizing for this Young Greens Congress. And uh, we had a big delegation from all over the world, from uh, from Europe, from America, Australia. So many, they all came. So they all about, I think, 700 young people came. So at that time, I got elected as secretary uh, of the African Young Greens. Uh, so that was the first formation. And from there, I went on to become uh, one of the three people representing Africa on the global Greens coordination. That was in 2008, yeah, again, 2008, uh, in Brazil. Uh, when we had the uh, second Global Greens Congress. Um, so that's how I moved in. So from the young, from the young was my platform. But unfortunately, we had a challenge in Africa that uh, um, most of the young people uh, who uh, were part of this Global Young Greens movement, or Young Greens movement, they, didn't, they, were not, they were coming from uh, other parties. They were not coming from Green parties. And this became the challenge. We had many from Kenya, but they were part of I think there was an ARC part at the time with President Kibaki, uh, the Rainbow Alliance, I think, or uh, ODM party. And uh, they were not part of the, uh, the Wangari Mathai's party. And those who are from Wangari Mathai parties, they are not very active. And uh, uh, the same uh, in Uganda, we didn't have a party. In Uganda, we didn't have a party. Though I was trying to start a party, but it was not yet a party. But we had one in society in, Uganda, in Rwanda. So they were, the chairman was from Nigeria, from another party, and they were from Algeria and others. Uh, I think we had a, one from a party from uh, Cameroon, and I think there were others from Senegal who were from the party. So the movement was started, but it died because other parties were not interested in the green parties. The young people were interested in environmentalism in what, but they didn't have the backing from the elders. So like our movement went uh, slow for the young greens. But the global level, there was a global greens, uh, which were started, that was the first Congress. So other countries in Europe, they had the European Young Greens Federation, which is still very, very active. And they, they were others from America, from Australia and others. So they continue being active. So we're not active because we didn't have the backup. So we've been in that process of starting up the African Young Greens. And uh, we have not been so successful. Why? Because we've been lacking backup from the national level. So there is a global platform 
We do have representatives uh, from Africa now on the global platform. Now we do have the uh, one person from Burkina Faso uh, who is representing Africa. There has been, uh, I think, uh, some two ladies from Kenya uh, representing Africa and the others. But uh, um, we haven't had a, a, a proper continental structure for the young greens, though it's been part of the plans to, to have that. Well, I think you know that we do have the African Greens Federation, which is a continental platform of the Green Parties in Africa. Yeah. So it has been part of our plan, and we still hope to do that. On the global level, we are moving, and we hope that uh, they will support. So now we have put emphasis. And uh, this entail was a global uh, Young Greens Congress, I think two weeks ago, uh, uh, where are we uh, on the global, um, part of the global Greens coordination. So we have, and global Greens coordination, we Africa raised our whole standard. If we continue letting anyone join in the Young Greens and got, get into the leadership, we we'll never move forward. So we requested that. Uh, for someone to be representing uh, 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 greens on the global greens must come from a, a green party. So this resolution, uh, luckily enough, it was voted, uh, uh, the amendment was uh, voted in the last Congress of the global greens, which they had uh, two weeks ago. And so this is a great success to us. So after almost 10 years, this is the first time we've had this success because before they could get anybody, as long as you say you were green environmentalists, they could put you in the global, global greens. And then you are not able to support us to do anything. So now we have the success now. So now we are back to where we wanted from the beginning to now go back to our parties, to strengthen our parties. So our parties should have, uh, this is the plan we have been having, but we now have to enforce, to have a Young Greens chapter or young, Youth Wing, or young, we call them Young Greens or Youth Wing, uh, then a Women Wing as well. Madame Dorothy here, She's our chairperson for the women in East Af women in Greece in East Africa. And uh, she's oh, we'll call her coordinator, uh, whichever, but she's still our leader. And then uh, we, we did have, uh, we, have we do have East African Greens Federation. We did set up some uh, structure, but as I said, they were not uh, so strong because it were not backed up by the national parties here. So now uh, in Rwanda, we have uh, resolved that we're going to have a youth wing established uh, this year. We did start with the provincial level, so we do have a structure of young greens on the provincial level. So now our next course of action will be starting them on a the district level and moving forward up to the grassroots level. If for the women, also we have already established a women greens network uh, uh, week on the provincial level and all the five provinces of Rwanda. So at least we have set actions, but the first very expensive yeah. exercise. And the young people yeah, are Frank. always the Honorable Dr. Frank. <laughs> That I, 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 we are running out of time. Whatever you're saying is very important, but we need to, we have other questions from the chat. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. I think that is useful for Mr. Moses. Dr. Muhammad, may, may I please just skip that and go to another question? Right, um, no problem, no problem. Oh, thank right. you so much because we are running out of time. And um, uh, Madam, President Anne Marie, the President of East African uh, Greens Federation, also raised her hand. May you please uh, ask your question or give your comment? Thank you so much. Madam Anne Marie, are you there? Yeah, she's there. Okay. I'm mute. I'm mute. She's on mute, eh? Tell her to unmute it. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm very sorry. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I was saying that um, it's a big pleasure for me to, to speak, but uh, it's not a question because uh, I know all uh, my friends are talking about. It was just a comment and a supplement because um, I think there is a lot of things that we can say in Africa. Uh, a lot of challenges and uh, what uh, my brothers from Rwanda was saying, I uh, was just say, want to say that uh, from the beginning we were together, maybe uh, they are tired to say that uh, they have even lose people uh, like the vice president of the uh, Green Party of Rwanda. Uh, uh, to say that uh, if uh, the lesson that we, we could learn from, from this uh, is that sometimes when you want really to, um, to work for green ideology uh, with our governance in Africa, 
uh, you should be ready even to, to lose life as uh, many of them have uh, had many problems when, when they were started to Uh, I think with time and we are losing Madam Anne. Uh, there is another important question in the chat from uh, one of our Kenyan Greens, uh, Lucy Mbaye, and she was asking, she said, thank you for sharing. How did you go about your fundraising? But before you answer that, I want you to answer it in addition with another question from uh, Mr. Marek Cheman to everyone. And it is an additional question on fundraising. Do your parties or your country laws allow receiving funds from overseas? That's a question I would like you to answer, please. Who's going to answer that? Yes. Uh, Dr. Frank Abineza. Yeah, please go on. How did you go about how did you go about your fundraising? And do you, do your countries allow funding from uh, overseas? First of all, the countries, they don't allow funding from overseas. As I mentioned in my presentation, that even our country does not even allow uh, NGOs to support a party. Even church organizations cannot support a party. So they've put it in a way that uh, any uh, company in the country which has shareholders, uh, like some shareholders cannot support a party. But in the, in the end of it, you find that all the companies that have money to support a party uh, have external shareholders, like they say, uh, the, the phone companies like MTN or Airtel or the Warner Brewers, you find Warner Brewers has Henken. You find uh, so anyone who has money, ha is, there's some fun, uh, external shareholder there. So the local companies, they don't have money and they also fear to support you. So basically, you find that NGOs, because they get money from outside, they cannot support you. Companies cannot support you. So it's quite a challenge because the law stops that. So how do we go about our fundraising? We are supposed to officially to write to all our members. Uh, and as I said, that the most of the members, uh, they don't have resources or good jobs. So we do have to make contributions as party members, sacrifices. I, for one, I took a loan uh, from Sweden because I had a nationality in Sweden. I took a, a big loan uh, to, for, to finance my campaign. So this is uh, an, an example I did. And uh, I mortgaged my house. Uh, even to pay up, uh, what I did when I, because I, to stand for president, I had to lose my nationality, Swedish citizenship. Uh, uh, so then I, I could not continue taking loans from Sweden. So I had to borrow money from Rwanda again, from Rwandan banks, pay Sweden, and then uh, they mortgage my house here in Rwanda. So this is the process. Someone has to take the sacrifice uh, to do that. And the members, uh, they have all contributed different uh, secretary general has contributed, other members have contributed. Yeah, we all try to make our own fundraising that way. But uh, we, we sometimes, as I said, we have to take loans. And uh, we took a loan for president and we lost it all. Yeah, so that's the sacrifice. Sometimes Thank you very much. Said, you can lose life, but also you lose all the resources. And uh, sometimes those in power, they are very interested in that, that you lose everything and you go down, don't stand up again. But you yeah. have to stand up once again. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much. That is very true what um, Madam Anne Marie said. Uh, Cynthia, I can see your hand up. Maybe we shall have time for your question again before the end. But at uh, this uh, moment, we have to go back to our speakers and see about the solutions. Some of your questions, I think, will be answered in this session. For example, if you had anything you had to answer and you didn't get time in your presentation, you can uh, answer it now. And um, in this order, I'm going to start with uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad Awad as a, a, a green politician in Africa, in uh, Egypt, and globally. What do you think we should do to handle this situation of struggling for democracy, of struggling for Greens in Africa to go in power? What do you think we should do? Dr. Muhammad Awad, please take the floor. Thank you. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have a real example in our hands uh, how the African Green Federations have been launched at the beginning. A young persons uh, who are acting right now as a, our African Green Hero, who start 
to, to discuss the, the idea of establishing a federation for the African Korean and who followed and who performed the whole idea. Uh, this hero, our Korean African hero, Frank Abeniza, who done and established and executed the whole idea of establishing African Korean Federation. That's mean what? That's mean because Moses also referred to that point in, in indirectly, because he was asking about the chance for the youth, for the green youth in Africa, because already he listened from us that we are saying a future and a resolution for the African challenges is to introduce us. How we can do it? That's a, that's the point right now. Uh, for Egypt is a still a very special case because it's running under a very special circumstances. But I'm talking based on my past experience with the other African countries. I think number one, Moses, you have to remember that we are green and the green believe in sustainability. And sustainability is not an natural resources only. Sustainability extended to the physical persons, to the man. So how we can apply that? We have to join to the parties, not to the military school. That's number one, because political parties, it is a school for the politicians. He learned there, he trained there, and he got the chance to introduce himself, to express his visions through the different activities of the political parties. And second, the only resolution in my mind, because since 12 years ago, we introduced in Africa, Frank Abeniza, we have to introduce a new person now. Frank Abeniza right now is an old man. So, sorry, Fra sorry, Dr. Frank. <laughs> so we have to sustain such things to introduce every year a new leaders. Thus will keep the green on a track. Thus will introduce to our people a new leaders with a new thoughts and have a good ability to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Muhammad Awad. Uh, may I now hear from uh, uh, Honorable Robina Kenanyoja? We have only uh, three minutes for that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I will try to fit into those minutes. Mm -hmm. um, yes, basically, actually, we have to continue. Uh, thanks to Dr. Awad and uh, Dr. Frank on those uh, inspirations. Uh, we have actually uh, to continue with the struggle since this is a, a green a struggle of the, the green democracy in, in uh, Africa. We have to continue with the struggle, as Dr. Ward says, inspiring new leaders, putting on board the youth, the women, uh, because the politics now on uh, the African continent, the green politics, it's a, it is still like a drop in an ocean. So. Uh, but also this doesn't come overnight. There is need for massive financing of green programs because we cannot afford radicalism as other parties. We are greens and we always stay green. So as greens, how do we do better? Perhaps investing in renewable energies and you know, uh, fundraise for really uh, the, the community transformation uh, within the mainstream of our ideology to demonstrate, to continue to demonstrate to the African communities that yes, this is all about uh, what uh, political leadership and what being green means, the ability to transform your society for economic empowerment, for protection of the environment, for having leaders that are, that are having a new generation of leaders that, are, that coexist and can be in the opposition. We need to continue with those efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Robin. And uh, it is great that you fitted in those minutes. I'm sorry I had to change because these same people here have another session and they have to go uh, in time to prepare for the next session. So that's why we are hurrying. <laughs> uh, Dr. Uh, Frank Abineza, something in two minutes because we have to end. 
Thank you very much, uh, Madam Dorothy. Uh, yes, thank you also for mentioning that. I just shared uh, uh, on the screen some links. Uh, for those who are interested to join, we have four other uh, uh, sessions. Uh, uh, one for the Joint Federation session and uh, the African Green se session, uh, which will be at uh, 14 hours GMT. So please join again, so we continue the discussion. Uh, sorry, uh, that was an advertisement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, back to, uh, to there are so many questions that were unanswered. An one was about uh, if Greens can uh, do oppose uh, Western uh, intervention, uh, because they sometimes consider us as uh, supported by Westerners. I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, this was the case for us in Rwanda, where they used to say that we are. Um, uh, an extension of the uh, euro pool and uh, somebody could accuse us of being agents of the CIA and they would say that we are backed by the European Union or the European Parliament and so there were a lot of things like that um, so uh, it and sometimes we we we, we fight back to say no this is not true uh, because at the time when we asked all the global green parties to write to the government of Rwanda and Dr. White was one of them who wrote to the government of Rwanda requesting for our discussion but the Greens from Australia, Senator Bob Brown from New Zealand, from Canada, Elizabeth May, Senator Honorable Elizabeth May, Rival Carolyn Lucas from UK, many they did. So when they saw that, they saw that we were all united and then they started accusing us. But now to say that uh, I, want, I gave an example of our Greens in Mauritius, who have stood up, stood up against the American occupation of the archipelago uh, called Chagos, Chagos uh, Island, which is being used by the Americans as a military base uh, to control the Indian Ocean. And the French government also has a base there, a military base there, but the Americans control that. So the Greens, they have even had a, a demonstration last week, and uh, they were even arrested uh, for that because they said Americans best should be out of there because it's part of Mauritius, but the Mauritius has no control over that. So that's a good example that I, I talked about that I'm giving that we have stood. Even for us here, we have stood against uh, uh, bad mining policies. Uh, most of the mining companies, they are Westerners. We have been uh, against that. Uh, we in the parliament have stood against uh, uh, nuclear because they are trying to bring up nuclear power in Rwanda. We voted against that because this is being brought by the Russians. The Russians are the ones uh, going to build a nuclear plant in Rwanda. So we have voted against it. We have been the media against that. So, uh, so many examples could be given uh, where, where we try to, to, to oppose foreign intervention, but also remaining on our green principles. So that's how what we do. So in brief, I think there's more need of uh, the struggle continues and we have to struggle to get into parliament or local government. Please don't uh, neglect local government. Uh, also, we have to be in government because if we are political parties, we need to have political power. So if you don't have political power, you don't have any power, if you just remain a uh, party without anything, then uh, it, it becomes very difficult to function. So I encourage all of you that as we struggle, we should struggle to get into government, struggle to get into parliament, struggle to get into local government. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Frank Abneza. Uh, Honorable Jean-Claude, please, 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 two minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Madam Dorothy. Yeah, what I can add on is just to encourage our colleagues from the neighboring countries to stand firm and uh, have confidence that uh, it's possible. Because if you see our political party in Rwanda started after, after some of the political parties or uh, and government organization of Greens from all those uh, neighboring countries. And uh, if you see here, our background as Rwanda, as, as Rwandans or our leaders, our country passed through so many difficulties like uh, genocide against the Tutsi, which was uh, the main reason that uh, they used to raise saying that uh, the, 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 no one is allowed to say whatever he wants because it can cause also uh, a similar case uh, here in Rwanda. And uh, all those ideas, all those reasons well, a big problem to us. And if you see also another issue of getting support like uh, money from outside here, it's repeated. 
we had so many challenges comparing to other, even if they have also their problems. But uh, to us, it was really unbelievable. It was very unbelievable. We said, no, this, we don't know if th this, uh, these things will happen. But after entering in it and fighting and struggling and uh, being patient, tortured, finally, now we are at a certain <laughs> position. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, though um, we still have also some challenges, but if I, say, if I see what we passed through, I believe that even in Uganda, it can happen. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, thank you so much. Burundi, it can happen. Yeah. Even in Kenya, it, it can happen. Everywhere it can happen because our problems here were so difficult compared to yours. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much. I, I'm sorry I had to cut you all short because of, uh, of the time we need for these uh, other speakers to join the other session. Uh, I don't want them to have a, a problem like I had in the beginning. That's how I didn't introduce myself. I, I have to say I'm Dorothy Navega uh, from the African Greens Federation and East African Greens Women's Network. And I, uh, I have to say thank you for all pa for participating. Uh, special thanks also to our organizers and our speakers and our attendants and special welcome to uh, Honorable Jean Lambert from UK Greens and, and uh, Honorable <laughs> and all the Honorables here. Yeah, thank you so much. We have to, uh, to close this session now because we, other people have to join others. And thank you, if goes for joining us. You are a great honor to the Greens. We really thank you for all you have done. Thank you so much. And now I declare this session closed. Thank you.